ask you all to come at 8 a.m. for lectures uh, twice a week. Uh, but uh, hopefully we'll have some uh, topics today that keep you relatively awake. And um, Jason had asked me to send out a paper. Did you all get the paper that I uh, distributed? So it's an old paper, and it was intentional because I wanted to introduce uh, and you'll be able to appreciate, I think, if you pay attention to the formatting. I wanted to, to introduce sort of a history uh, in tissue engineering, uh, kind of since the beginning. And this paper that I sent out is really one of the seminal papers in the field. And um, two individuals that um, wrote this uh, review paper, it's not their first one. Uh, their first publication was actually in science, but I picked one out of The Lancet. And it was a few years later, I think it was about six years later that they published this. And <clears throat> uh, so Joseph Vicanti is a uh, surgeon, and Robert Langer is a scientist. He's a PsyD because his, his doctoral work was done over in the UK. And so the PsyD there is similar to a PhD here in the States. Um, and so it was a team of a surgeon at Mass General and a scientist at MIT. And they kind of are airmarked as the fathers of tissue engineering. So <clears throat> to, to get us going in this space of tissue engineering, really in the 1980s and 90s is when it started to really balloon. And in the, there wasn't social media. So the popular media, um, Time Magazine, Newsweek, kind of the, the coffee table um, media articles were all talking about what was going on in the field of tissue engineering. And we were doing experimentations where we were creating replacement body parts and we were testing them. And some of the first places we would test them was in a subcutaneous environment. And that subcutaneous environment in a mouse would be implanting a replacement cartilaginous structure to regrow ears. Or, you know, as, as this uh, cartoonist has depicted here, you know, you're just putting all sorts of different body parts in different locations. So this field of tissue engineering is really um, on the spectrum of looking at devices. And some classic devices that you're probably familiar with would be like heart valves or replacement blood vessels, vascular grafts. You know, these are polymers or synthetic materials. Or maybe in orthopedics, you might think of something like um, a replacement hip that's a titanium alloy. And <clears throat> then over on the biologic side, what might resonate with more of you, now we're going to try to modulate things by delivering uh, different types of biological substances. And then in the middle here, you've got drug interactions. And really, this field is combining the principles of engineering and life sciences kind of in a, in a, in a mosh pit, if you will. And one thing that was interesting out of the 80s and the 90s is folks that started um, studying tissue engineering, uh, there wasn't a bachelor's degree. There wasn't a graduate degree in tissue engineering. And so you really kind of had to pick one of these disciplines to focus on. That was sort of your core. And <clears throat> in the early 2000s, there was um, this dot-com bubble. And a lot of those companies folded because they were startup companies that were running out of money. And so tissue engineering in the field sort of had a poisoned name. And then they rebranded like we do with everything. And now they refer to it as regenerative medicine. Enough years have passed since the dot-com bubble when these startup companies um, first started. So, you know, we're back to using these terms interchangeably. Tissue engineering doesn't have sort of the negative connotation as it used to. So some of the definitions of regenerative medicine, but really the two terms can be used interchangeably. It's a broad definition for innovation of medical therapies that enable the body to repair or replace or restore uh, anything that's damaged. So that's really kind of the overarching definition of what this field looks like. And again, it's a pretty young field. Langer and Vacani kind of were... Um, credited with you know starting the field and if you look back at the paper they sort of walk through history like in 1933 um, they they reference some early tissue engineering work um, looking at 
uh, putting a uh, mouse tumor cell line in a polymer. Uh, they looked in 1975 encapsulating pancreatic islet cells to try to make an artificial pancreas. Now, those individuals in 1933 and 1975 didn't say, hey, we're doing tissue engineering. This is Langer and Bacani looking back at history saying they were actually playing around with this field even before we actually coined the term. But the idea here is looking at ways to replace heart muscle, um, skin after burns, or severe full thickness wounds. And I'll talk about some of these things as we as we walk through. So this is, these are old slides of mine, and you can probably tell with the formatting, okay? So there's kind of three sections to the talk. There's like the old school, you know, blue background, yellow text. That was the format that we all had to do. Four by three, right, because we didn't have widescreen. Because they, they actually, we used to print them on actual slides and have a carousel in the back that would be humming. Um, and so I, I just morphed three presentations together. So we're going to go through the old presentation from the 80s and the 90s, and then we're going to move into um, a little bit newer tech, and then we'll talk a little bit about what I'm doing here at the university. Okay, so you can kind of see the evolution of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. So we became really fascinated as a, as a society. This is Life magazine in 1989, and this was titled The Replaceable You, and you can see all the different implants. I thought this was obviously funny because this is a pacemaker that's over on the right side of the body. So, so obviously the artist didn't really have an appreciation. But there's a total artificial heart right here, so maybe they just needed real estate to place it. But it's not necessarily um, anatomically accurate. So you can kind of understand that these coffee table magazines are really kind of catching the buzz. And uh, Langer and Vacani's paper actually references this article where it talks about the size of the field. So this is um, uh, Business Week 1998 that they actually published. Uh, it's on the first page of this paper, far left column at the bottom, and they're talking about the size. There's a uh, three to five billion dollar industry growth rate, 22.5 percent annual um, year over year growth, employing about um, 2,500 scientists and an annual expenditure of $450 million. So there's nothing like motivating a group to actually go into a field by creating jobs, creating funding opportunities, and it, it was a wide open space. Nobody was in this space. So Biotech Bodies, Business Week, 1998. Move forward a little bit, Scientific American. Again, not a peer-reviewed publication. These are coffee table publications where the general public is starting to think, you know, if my arm, if my knee isn't working anymore, I'll just replace it. This will be great. My hip's gone. I'm just going to get a new hip, which is actually true these days. We have more and more joint replacements that are happening than ever before. This article was talking about regrowing organs. And um, this was my early work. We're not going to talk about it much today at all. Um, this isn't my publication, but in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, there was a lot of us that were actually playing around with cardiovascular regenerative medicine, trying to repair heart tissue after a myocardial infarction or after a heart attack, um, growing entire organs, taking uh, cell, uh, organs out of animals, decellularizing them, leaving the scaffold behind, repopulating them with the patient's own cells, and then allowing them to, like Frankensteinian in the lab, start to spontaneously contract. So, Sky was kind of the limit back then. And then, um, you know, on Time Magazine, uh, this, this came out in 06, where we started getting really fascinated with stem cells. Okay, so that's a really fast history of kind of how the field got to where it is. Let me pause and see if there's any questions. Anybody familiar with some of these things or? Okay, all right, so some of it. How about stem cells? Probably everybody's heard about stem cells now. But in the mid-2000s, the general public was just fascinated with stem cell technology. They really thought it was going to be the holy grail. And we started doing a lot of experimentation with embryonic stem cells, adult-derived stem cells, and, you know, results were variable. The, the regulatory environment, okay, so the regulatory environment has changed. And so what is this? Well, I'm more of a translational scientist than a basic scientist. 
And so um, I've always been fascinated about figuring things out that aren't working, finding a solution, and then bring it into the marketplace so that someone can benefit from it. And um, <clears throat> in this country, in a lot of uh, westernized countries, we have a regulatory agency that protects the public and looks out for public safety. And what they're caring about is, hey, if what you're building or you're designing, is it going to cause harm, number one? Number two, is it actually going to work? Is it going to do what you say it does? So if you have a bottle of tonic water and a kid drinks it, is that a problem? If you have a bottle of tonic water and you're trying to sell that it's going to cure cancer, it's not unsafe because you, maybe you've said it's, un, it's safe, but does it actually do what the claim says it's going to do? And so this is true with just about everything that you use with respect to over-the-counter medication. Um, so this was in the early 1900s in this country, um, the Food, Drug, Cosmetic Act. Okay, So this environment um, says that in the tissue engineering space, if you start combining things, and remember, the premise here is we're combining fields. We're taking like basic biology or physiology or chemistry, and we're combining it with engineering. So you're going to have a device, because usually engineers make devices, and you're going to have probably a drug or a biologic. So now this is what's called a combination therapy. Well, this environment completely changed. And it wasn't until about the early 2000s, 2001 to 2003, that the branch of combination products at FDA was started, was formed. And so there's a lot of language in here, but I'm just going to you know, highlight a couple of things, like a device coated or impregnated with a drug or a biologic. You've heard about drug-eluting stents. These would be things that have like antimicrobial uh, coatings, even um, contraceptives that have drugs uh, in, impregnated into them, or pacemaker leads that are coated with different types of anti-fibrotic agents so that when they have to go in and revise, they can pull out the pacemaker lead really easily. So all of these now are regulated as a combination therapy. And so one thing for you to keep in mind is more regulations typically means more expense to build the technology and deliver it to the public. Okay, so this is kind of the, um, the yin and the yang in the United States. You get new technology and you get a higher expense. New technology, a higher expense. And, and we're always trying to fight for more affordable health care, but it, it, it actually kind of goes counterintuitive to the development cycle. Does that make sense? So if we, if we lessen the regulations, it's less expensive for companies to develop. But then you bring in safety issues to the public. And so it's this kind of tug of war that's really important that we have. But again, the tug of war, usually, just like anything in this country, it swings one way, and then it swings the other way. And somewhere in between, when that pendulum is swinging, is a kind of the sweet spot. And we have it for a period of time. But this is really where things are today. So back in the uh, 90s, um, I went to the University of Arizona for graduate school and uh, was working on revascularizing ischemic hearts. And this company. Uh, actually licensed our technology uh, because they had the goal, they had licensed Langer and Vacani's technology, and uh, they were working on Langer and Vacani's work um, trying to build out replacement skin over here. And then this angiogenesis patch and the vascular grafts is the technology they licensed out of the U of A. Um, and so I had a job out of grad school, moved to Southern California to work for Advanced Tissue Sciences. Now, I'll tell you, in 2002, uh, we filed for bankruptcy. And they are no more. Now, this technology, Dermograph, that I'm going to talk about here a little bit, still exists. But this was the platform technology. It was a scaffold. You impregnate it with cells. Over a period of time in an incubator, you actually form a complete new tissue. This is what the tissue looks like under scanning electron microscopy. These are the polymer fibers. This is a fibroblast that's kind of spreading out, kind of reaching and grabbing onto the matrix. So it was a living tissue. It was a replacement skin. The opportunity, again, you can see the data is pretty old, back in the 90s. Um, diabetic ulcers, venous ulcers, acute pressure ulcers. These were the patient populations that we were going after. This was our manufacturing setup. 
Um, this is four pieces of skin, four pieces of skin. You can see you slide them into a manifold. You can get a dozen or so um, cassettes, and you're circulating uh, culture media in one and out the other. Okay? It was about a two to three week incubation period. Okay, I have some clinical images, so I'm just giving you a little bit of a warning. This one's not so bad. These are diabetic foot ulcers, so it's the bottom of somebody's foot. You can't really tell. Uh, so this was the replacement skin. This is in, uh, I think, mid-90s. Yeah, I think the date here, date stamp is like, no, this is November of 95. Uh, so this is a clinical trial we did at UCLA. And the inclusion criteria for this was, this is the heel of a patient's foot, it had to be open for at least six months. So it wasn't healing. It's considered a chronic non-healing foot ulcer. And horribly uncomfortable. Now here's the good news is they have peripheral neuropathy, meaning that their, their uh, nerves in the periphery have lost their sensitivity. So it looks worse than it feels to the patient. Does that make sense? But the problem is this is ripe for infection. And if it becomes infected, because our skin colonizes an entire population of bacteria, and we keep this nice homeostatic balance with that microbiome that's on our skin. And in this situation, now that microbiome becomes unbalanced. It can actually take over. And so if this infection continues, now you have to amputate, and you amputate distal, and you go proximal. Okay? So we closed this in 10 weeks, complete uh, epithelialization, which was really, really nice of a result. Every week, we actually transplanted some additional uh, dermagraft. This is laser Doppler just showing kind of how it works with revascularization. So the tracing, the black and white tracing is the tracing of the wound. And then the tracing in red with the color image is showing blood flow. And cool colors like blues and blacks are low blood flow. And then the warm colors like red are high blood flow. So you can kind of appreciate after one, two, three weeks, three weeks down here, you're getting more coloration in the wound bed. So you're actually reperfusing the wound. Okay, this one's a little bit more horrific, so you might need to turn away. Um, this is actually a facial wound. Uh, this individual was cutting wood with a chainsaw, and it slipped. So if you want to turn away, that's fine, okay? So this is how it presented. Yeah, it was pretty graphic. And um, uh, you can actually, you know, sort of appreciate full thickness wound because you're actually down to cartilaginous tissue. You can actually see portions of the maxilla uh, being exposed here. This is after closure. This dermograph was packed into the wound bed, this replacement skin. It was closed with stitches, obviously, and then butterfly tape. Uh, this is one year later. Okay. Where did we get the fibroblasts? And I told you it's a scaffold. We took fibroblasts, not stem cells. This was pre-stem cells. And we impregnated the scaffold with fibroblasts. You, any idea where we got fibroblasts? They're not embryonic but they're very close. They're neonatal fibroblasts. Cortical blood. Cortical blood. It's a good, good guess. Uh, foreskin. foreskin. Neonatal foreskin. Post-circumcision. So skin, basically, after three weeks. Kind of an interesting source, right? Yeah, we got a lot of chuckles over that in the industry, but it worked really well. Okay, so this was pre-stem cells, and then in the mid-2000s, because that was in 95 to maybe 2002, in the mid-2000s, stem cells became all the buzz. And this is an adult bone marrow stem cell that's been pseudo-colored on the cover of Time magazine saying, hey, this is the future of where this field's going. Questions? All right, I'm going to lightning forward um, to um, this company. This company, we started in, uh, let's see, the mid-2010s, like 2015. So we're like circa 10 to 12 years post-advanced tissue sciences. Now, that dermograph technology, that chainsaw guy, that dermograph technology, you can Google it, dermograph still sold today. It changed hands like three, we sold it like three times to different companies, you know, transaction. Like one company sold it for a while, then they sold it to somebody else, and they sold it, and that's just how, you know, uh, capitalist society works, right? Um, so now uh, I think who owns it is Organogenesis, which ironically was Advanced Tissue Science's biggest competitor because they had a uh, competitive product called um, 
AppleGraft. And AppleGraft was a multi-layer. It was fibroblasts and keratinocytes. And they would cold culture it, making like the actual layer of skin. It was a little bit more sophisticated. But it was a little bit more difficult to actually transport because it was a living, a living tissue. And they transported it in small little bioreactors. It was really expensive. We actually froze ours down and sold it in a frozen state and shipped it on dry ice. And then they had to thaw it. So 10, 12 years later, um, we moved into the space where I started saying, OK, well, maybe we don't need the cells. Everything like Langer and Vacani in the old days and then up until the mid-2000s was heavy on cell-based therapies. And now you have all these either xenotransplant issues or allotransplant, xeno meaning different species or allo meaning from one person to another. If it's not autologous, it's not from the same patient, um, you have rejection issues that you worry about based upon um, MHC recognition. Now, the fibroblast technology was interesting because it came from another person, donated to another person, no immunosuppressant drugs needed, but the neonatal fibroblast from the foreskin was so early in its infancy, if you will, that the immune sophistication of expressing the MHC complexes was premature. So it was, it was kind of like this perfect window of opportunity. And the matrix that they would make actually created, um, kind of like in bone, when you have like the little um, caverns that the bone cells, the osteocytes live in. Um, they're called lacunae. The, the matrix that forms around that bone cell, the same thing happens in skin. And these fibroblasts kind of live, as you saw with that scanning electron micrograph, they live inside this matrix that they make. And that matrix is kind of like an immune protection shell. So if you're outside of that window, when we played with embryonic stem cells as a field. I actually personally never did any em embryonic stem cell research. We did a lot of, and still do, a lot of adult-derived stem cell research. But you have still these rejection issues. If you take the cell out of the equation, you don't have any immune issues because that's where actually the antigen labels are. So this company was really kind of founded on birth tissue. So now we're back to early life. And if you can see a theme here, young tissue is superior to old tissue. Every time we tried to source where to get cells, where to get tissue, we weren't, ask, we weren't going to senior living centers and asking for donations. We're trying to get as young as possible. And that was the whole buzz about embryonic tissue is because it's essentially as young as it gets. Now, birth tissue, after the baby's born, mom and baby are celebrating, there's a placenta that's delivered. There's umbilical cord that's tossed away. There's cord blood. So the field really started playing with, what can we do with the placenta? What can we do with the cord? What can we do with um, the blood within? There are stem cells in umbilical cord blood. There are stem cells within the placenta. Well, we went after the placenta and separated out the uh, amniotic layer from the chorionic layer. And out of the amniotic layer, which is the baby side, um, we pulled mesenchymal-derived stem cells. We culture those. They create growth factors and cytokines and release them into this tissue culture media. And we collect that, leaving the cells behind, adhere to the plastic. An acellular growth factor cytokine-enriched fluid. Kind of this, was, this is sort of the newest state of the state of regenerative medicine. We, we've kind of left the cells. We let them do their thing. We let the biology happen, and then we don't use them anymore. We have less regulatory questions from the agency. We have less rejection issues. We have less problems overall from a safety standpoint. Then the tissue that we pull and extract those cells out of, we actually make membranes. We make a single layer membrane or we make a double layer membrane. So this, the membrane itself, the dual graft, these are fibroblasts that have been seeded onto it. You know, they, they love the scaffold, so it's cytofriendly. Um, it's acellular, so we can store it on the shelf for five years, which makes it really easy to transport to military battlefields, um, store it in medical clinics uh, versus having a frozen product or a bioreactor that we used to ship around the world in the 80s and the 90s. Okay? The fluid, we can store it at room temperature, believe it or not. 
because, and it has an eight, actually this is old, this, now it's at 24 months because when you do shelf life studies, you can extend the shelf life as you get data that fulfills it. Um, it's acellular, so there's nothing that's going to really expire. You know, most of the growth factors in cytokines are protein-based. And proteins are very stable as long as they're kept within an environment that helps to, you know, neutralize them from any, you know, acid changes or large, you know, denaturing fluctuations. You know, think about your peanut butter in your uh, pantry, right? I mean, it can sit around for a long time. Um, the whole concept here is leveraging uh, microbiology. So we take these cells, we know through kind of just classic protein manufacturing that they're going to spit out all these growth factors and cytokines into their outside environment based upon external cues as well as intracellular signaling. And we're just kind of hijacking the cell to let it do its thing. Um, over time, these are the major stages of healing whether it's bone healing, skin healing, tendon healing, ligament healing. Uh, this technology, the fluid, the acellular fluid, we're in phase two clinical trials for ankle arthritis. So we actually went a direction a little bit different than wound healing. And that was more of a business decision because there's a lot of people in wound healing right now. So we went for ankle arthritis. Um, so this is a time-lapsed video. It's sped up. That's one stem cell, mesenchymal stem cell, in culture under the microscope. Uh, over a, about a 12-hour period, this is sped up really fast. That cell is dividing, and you'll see all these little floaty things coming by in, in the tissue culture media. So this is just a flask. There's something floating right there. And then after a little while, you'll see these uh, budding vesicles, these exosomes, as this cell is serving as a manufacturing facility. It's just pumping out growth factors and cytokines. So this is you know, cell biology just live in action. I mean, it's videotaped, so it's, it's tape delayed. But, you know, this is, what, this is what we all study in cell biology, right? And now what we're doing is we're just saying, hey, stem cell, go do your thing. And when you're done, I'm going to say thank you, and we're not going to collect you. We're just going to collect all of the supernatant, all the fluid that you just got, uh, got done conditioning. So when we were talking to surgeons about this, um, we had to have some tagline of, you know, hey, how do you, how do you message this to surgeons? Well, the whole field was so hyper-focused on stem cells. They had a tough time getting their head around, you're not going to keep the stem cells? Like, no, we're not. But all of these signaling molecules, look how, look how bumpy these are getting. Like, all of the extravesicular, you know, exocytosis of all these um, components that are manufactured, now that's going to have activity on your own stem cells that are resident in the tissue. And now we know in the field that adult tissue has a rich population of stem cells. Now, if you're 80 years of age or you're 20 years of age, those stem cells have different regenerative potentials, right? We can see that with healing responses in our older patients. But from about the age of 20 to about the age of, say, 50, um, this process can work really, really well in healing. Okay, so some more yucky images. Sorry if, if it's overly clinical, but uh, this was a combo therapy, kind of getting back to my roots of wound healing. And then the last segment, we'll talk about what I do here uh, at NAU. It's all really wound healing, okay, skin wound healing. So this was a wound that presented as a 47-year-old female. She broke her ankle, um, and this had been open uh, for, I think it was about 11 or 12 months, it was, it was open. It had been oozing for 12, like a year, okay? And she was a very complicated patient, um, you know, and in, in clinical medicine, when you talk about these, you have to get inf uh, informed patient consent that you can't talk about who it is, but you can talk about all the details. So she was very noncompliant. Um, she had broke her ankle. They had put in orthopedic uh, appliances, and, um, uh, but she was an unmanaged diabetic, and the surgeon says she's probably an alcoholic. Uh, she just drank a lot. So this is what we got. Um, this is, it looks a little worse before it gets better because these are releasing incisions. To kind of, This is so swollen, and you can see it's gangrenous. It's oozing with pus. It's, it's infected. This is that diabetic foot ulcer situation that I was telling you about, poor perfusion of the distal extremity. Um, we're not going to use a dermograph. This is an acellular therapy. So you can just see the time lapse. 
um, getting better. You know, this is about two months later, month and a half later, it's already starting to improve. Now you can see about a year, 13 months after the start, completely closed. Okay. So <clears throat> we used the graft material that we packed into the void space and then we injected into the uh, wound margin and into the wound bed itself, um, not liters, but lots of milliliters of, of the fluid. Okay. This will probably be the next clinical trial. When we go from ankle arthritis, we'll go over to wound healing. So, okay, so that's kind of the progression of where the field has come, right? So now with tissue engineering regenerative medicine, we really have moved away from cell-based therapies. We're still using the cells, but we're kind of leaving the cells behind after they do their cell biology, and we just kind of focus on leveraging everything that they've manufactured. Questions? Uh, I think there's, there's, those are definitely advantages. So you don't have as many regulatory problems. Um, you don't have storage issues. It's a little bit more friendly um, from a, like a supply chain. Um, but then one to the patient is, I think it's, it's a safer product overall. You don't have the concern of, hey, is there going to be a reaction if there is an antigen recognition? You know, because you don't have cells that are making antigens. You have the products that they make and all the antigens are left behind. So no immunosuppression. Um, these, what's, what's really fascinating biology, and I think many of you can appreciate this, I think in a, a group of 25 to 30 graduate students, you know, you're probably, your model of experimentation, I, I, I'm going to guess very few of you are using the human, right? Maybe a couple are, but most of you are using some other vertebrate or maybe even an invertebrate. Well, when it comes to... Um, biology and conservation of these proteins and growth factors, you can take, you can take them and translate them to um, different organisms, even plants. So plants will make different proteins that we actually will use in a similar fashion, which is pretty cool, but actually shouldn't surprise us, right? In this room, it doesn't. And it surprises the general public. They're like, hey, you, you've got a tomato lectin and I can use it, and it helps with a healing process? Well, well, yeah. Well, I'm so different than a tomato. It's like, okay. <laughs> right? Like, we're all, we're all going to, well, we won't pick that battle today. We'll just, we'll just let that one sit right there. So the conservation of biology with these different proteins and growth factors is really beautiful. And so I think I like that elegance even more so than kind of the business rationale of, hey, less regulatory hurdles, uh, uh, simpler supply chain, like, hey, this is actually just biological conservation in action. And we're kind of proving in this, in, in this space that we can use things that are made in biology in many different cross-organism um, capacities, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Because of the same reason why they have the issues in the first place. Is that yeah, so we'll get into it a little bit here um, when we start looking at mechanical uh, performance. Okay. So, <clears throat> so what Dr. Saul is asking is a good question. So like if you have, let's say you have 70% of your body burned or severe trauma, um, car accident, and lots of, lots of wounds, bless you, um, you know, there's two main things that we worry about with the skin being compromised. So number one is water loss because it's this covering that keeps, you know, most of our water in our body. Not all, but most. And then the second one is infection. So once you hydrate the individual and you control the water loss and they're not going to dehydrate, now you're worried about infection. So you got to cover with something. So what we'll do is we'll either take cadaveric skin from donated people that have passed, um, <clears throat> or you'll do an autologous transplant. You'll take it from some other, like lower back, from the buttocks region. You actually, um, if it's yours, you don't worry about decellularizing. If it's cadaveric, you decellularize it. 
but you usually put it through a tissue mesher, which actually is, is basically kind of a piece of skin goes in, you turn the crank, it smashes out and takes this into this tabletop size. So you can take a little bit of skin and go a long way. So now the mechanics of that skin graft are totally compromised. So yeah, it's a covering, but as the patient heals, it's not going to have the elastomeric properties. Like you can all grab your skin right now and pull it and let it go. And what does it do? Does it stay here? If you're severely dehydrated, it kind of does. But if, it, if you're not, it'll snap right back because of the elastin component in your skin. So when you do that tissue measure, you completely smash and alter all the mechanics within the within the, the, the engineering side of the material. So it works, but it's not ideal, I guess is the point. Rob, where's, where's the field using this kind of technology right now? Is this like emerging? Is it like well used and yeah. working out? Which technology, like the uh, old one or the, the, the A-cellular? The A-cellular. Uh, it's, it's pretty, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, Okay, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov. You can type in, um, like in the search parameter, you can type in axolotl biologics, or you put my last name, and you'll pull up this clinical trial. Um, you could pull up regenerative therapies in wound healing or regenerative therapies in, in orthopedics, and you'll see a laundry list of other companies doing really kind of the same stuff. So it is just completely mushroomed. So, but we, so we go after birth tissue, for the biologic reasons that I, I talked about. Early young tissue, it's throwaway tissue, um, it's discarded, it's biohazard, so it's, it's, it's nice to recycle it versus just toss it out. There are some individuals that um, will cryopreserve cord blood or umbilical cord or the placenta, they'll do something with it, but for the most part, if you talk to labor and delivery across the country, most of this stuff ends, ends up in a biohazard red bag and we incinerate it, which is really sad. And so it doesn't take many donated tissues to actually use it. You know, like it, it, it's like biologic recycling, you know, <laughs> you know, for, for us Flagstaff people. I mean, it's kind of an interesting concept. But there's other sources. So bone marrow, people will pull bone marrow derived stem cells. People will pull um, umbilical cord blood and pull the stem cells out of the umbilical cord. Uh, the umbilical cord itself within the medial layer actually has a stem population of mesenchymal stem cells. Um, Platelet-rich plasma is a huge field right now where you'll pull blood from a donor and you spin it down, you get the platelet-rich portion that has circulating stem cells in it. Now, again, if you're pulling blood from a 70-year-old patient, the cellular machinery of that donation is 70 years old. The cellular machinery of, a, of birth tissue is, you know, nine months. So... Um, yeah, it's, it's mushroomed. Everyone's go, why is everybody going so many different directions? Maybe why you're asking that. Well, because now, now, now you get into the field of patenting because you're in the commercial space. So the big difference between, you know, commercial, now we're going academic. So my world is, is kind of, I got one foot in industry and I always have. And then I, I missed the classroom. So I decided to try to come back to the university and, you know, interact with students, undergrads and grad students and you know, I've got a couple of my grad students in here and, and just kind of help try to train the next generation of scientists. But when I was in grad school, like going into industry was like you were the black sheep in the family. You were just, I mean, there was something wrong with you. I had a committee member that asked me after we, I defended saying, hey, so what did you decide you were going to do next? It's like, well, advanced tissue science has licensed the technology, so I'm actually going to go work for them. And he's, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I had such big aspirations for you. I was like, all right, well, thanks. I'll see you later. <laughs> so I think it's changed a lot now where we become, you know, I'll use the term, like in the field, we become more open-minded and inclusive about, hey, there's a lot of different things you can go do with your, with your education. And, and for me, I decided to come back to, to academia because I missed it. But, um, you know, if you look at the field in the commercial space, why there's these different pathways of, hey, bone marrow derived, placental derived, or birth tissue, cord blood, is because you can file intellectual property and get patents issued to protect your methods, right? So there's three main patents. There's composition of matter. So you can patent it. Say, I patent 
paper, right? Any paper I own the patent on. Then there's um, methods of manufacture. I patent how to make the paper. Um, then there's methods of use. I patent how you use the paper, where you use it as a tool to write, or you make a paper airplane, right? Or you, you roll it up and you make a, you know, a blow dart. So methods of use. So those are the three. So composition of matter is the most elegant because you can keep everybody else out. You own it. How you make it, methods of manufacture is the next one. How you use it, whether you use it for wound healing or orthopedics, see what I mean? So that's why it's all mushroomed. Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting because it's great for society because now we get access to all of this really great new technology. Let me go over here first, Jeff, and then we'll come back. It has. Um, not with a lot of success in the central nervous system, but in the periphery, um, it, it actually really works well. And probably the reason for that has to do with the biology, where in the central nervous system are stem population that exists in the, so I'm talking brain and spinal cord. So you're talking about like um, spinal cord injury patients or post-stroke patients. Um, there's not a lot of regenerative capacity in the central nervous system because the stem population of cells that live there are more dormant and less plastic, which is odd. In the periphery, peripheral nerves actually can regenerate pretty well. Um, but if it's severe, you could use some assistance, and so that's where the, the acellular technology. And there still are, I, I'm saying acellular, that's, that's the bandwagon I'm on, I'm on. The field is split. There still are people that are heavily into cell-based therapies. But what's happened there in the popular media, and I didn't go there today, is um, there's been a lot of bad behaving organizations on the cell-based therapies with stem cell, stem cell therapy. So when you read the stem cell therapy literature in the popular media, you'll see a lot of outlandish label claims like, oh, it's curing Alzheimer's. Oh, we're, we're, we're fixing this. We're curing cancer. We're... And then the FDA came in and said, oh, no, 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 no. And the FDA has like, kind of shut a lot of those companies down and have pushed them into clinical trials so that you can prove that it's safe and effective rather than just saying from the beginning of the lecture rather than just saying, hey, this does whatever you want it to do. It's not the magic bullet. So yes, uh, in periphery. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm just kind of curious like where So from like 15 to 21, 22, 21, 2015 to 2021, it was like the wild, wild west. Very few regulations being enforced. And it was rampant. It was everywhere. And then in 21, the regulations changed. And the FDA said, now you have to go into clinical trials with this kind of technology. And that's when we went into a clinical trial for, for ankle arthritis. So the fluid is not on the market anymore. It was, and we took it off the market because we're in a phase two clinical trial. What's still available is PRP. So a lot of clinics will still pull blood from a patient or pull bone marrow from the patient, and they'll, it's an autologous harvest clinically, and then they do post-processing, and then they deliver it back to the same patient. In that little sphere, the FDA has very little jurisdiction. So that's what's happening today, pretty rampantly with great results. Again, a younger patient, better results than an older patient. I would say the PRP or bone marrow regenerative medicine, um, from you know, taking it from a, a patient and giving it back to the same patient, the window of opportunity is up until about the age of 50. And then after that, really your, your cellular machinery just changes so much that you're not really making the same stuff that you made when you were younger. You know, so a stem cell is not a stem cell. It's not a stem cell. We just, you know, we age out. And I could probably ask this classroom why, and we'd have like 30 different answers. Because <laughs> if we could figure that out as biologists, we would, you know, we'd really disrupt the field. Okay, great questions. You guys want to hear what I do here? So this is, this is like the last piece of, of the lecture. So we've kind of taken at, at my lab here at NAU, kind of in the direction of, of focusing on skin, and uh, started getting much more interested in 
questions that were more academic in nature. And they're going to have a translational application, which I think you'll be able to appreciate. But um, there's kind of three sections here. And you know, Jason, this last one is, is the one that talks about the mechanics. But we're going to look at contaminants, whether it's things that are you know, found in our diet, really our drinking water, or you know, things that are found on top of our skin of this, this sort of microbiome. So those are the two kind of angles. And then the last one is just trying to build mechanically better performing materials. So metalloids, um, whether it's heavy metals um, uh, like depleted uranium or metalloids like arsenic. And uh, some of the collaborators here on this grant um, that are listed. So if we look across the world at drinking water, um, we've kind of honed in on two uh, top candidates of, of being problematic. One is arsenic and the second one is depleted uranium. And I'm going to kind of focus today uh, more on the arsenic side of the story, just for the sake of time. But you can see, see from this sort of impact chart that there are hot spots around the globe of arsenic because it's naturally occurring. We have it in our groundwater here in Flagstaff. We have great water, especially if you travel down to the valley and you, you know, kind of do the taste test. Um, you know, it's tasteless here, and you can taste the water in Phoenix, which usually is a bad sign. Uh, but nevertheless, you can kind of appreciate here that there's a hot spot within the Southwest, and particularly on native lands. And so now we've entered into this world of like health disparities, and you know inequity, um, and what's going on. And of course, in their infinite wisdom, um, we pass these uh, environmental limits, and there's a threshold of you know, the maximum contamination level of 10 parts per billion, and anything below that is actually safe to drink, and that's where our arsenic fall, levels fall in Flagstaff. Now, you can see based upon, you know, so here's Loop. So Flagstaff's somewhere around here. This is mostly the Navajo Nation that's being shown here. But you can appreciate based upon the size and the coloration of these wells that there are lots of water supply locations in native lands here in the Southwest that are well above the quote unquote safe level. Now our research, we actually try to play in the level below safe, because if you can show that it's having an impact on skin or skin fibroblasts, and, and why did we go there? Well, when we looked at the literature, there was this big gap between this connection of like arsenic and uranium water contamination and wound healing. We see a lot of it in other types of diseases, but not wound healing. So we see it with cancer, kind of an obvious one. We see it with autoimmunity or diabetes or cardiovascular disease, where arsenic exposure in high chronic levels, like for the lifetime of the individual, can be a problem. Where there was a huge gap was in wound healing. We thought, hey, we'll, we'll go look at wound healing and see if we can show something. So uh, one of my former PhD students actually you know, adopted this method um, from the literature. So this was uh, Bronson Pinto, and he took it from Lang. But basically what we do in our um, tissue culture hood is grow skin fibroblasts. So I'm back to skin fibroblasts. And after a period of time, we um, split them out into a 12 volt plate. They grow to confluence. So this is just an image of a one-layer fibroblast monolayer. We scratch it with a P200 pipette, and we create a wound, a gap. And it's really a migration assay, because now how quickly can these fibroblasts close the gap? So this is our screening tool on the bench top here. Um, and these data uh, from uh, another grad student, this is from Nathan Cruz, uh, up top on A is actually acute exposure. and B is actually chronic exposure. Um, and really, the take home message, and that's what's graphed here with uh, acute on C and chronic on D, is when you go to a chronic level, you actually reduce the impact, or sorry, you accelerate the impact by an order of magnitude. So let me, let me explain. So you can kind of see here at um, no arsenic at zero, 
And then these are 0 0.01, 0 0.11, and 10. Um, and those are in uh, micromolar amounts of arsenic. So at no uh, arsenic contamination at, at zero arsenic, just normal wound healing, after 24 hours, the wound's almost healed. So after 24 hours here at um, uh, 0.01, you can see it's still a little bit open. And at 10 micromolar after 24 hours, it's still wide open. Well, just at one micromolar under chronic conditions almost gives you the same result as 10 micromolar in a 24-hour period. So that arsenic is preventing those fibroblasts from closing. Does that make sense? So that was kind of our, you know, our aha moment. So then we moved from a benchtop model into a, a mammalian model. So this is a mouse model. We did a full thickness wound in the back of these animals. And this particular um, study was looking at sex differences. And we were trying to look to see if we saw uh, greater impacts in males versus female mice uh, with arsenic in the drinking water. And the arsenic levels in the drinking water were right below that maximal contamination level safety value. So they were, it was technically safe water we were giving the animals. And that was actually part of the Iacook submission because we had pushback from the committee saying, what's your justification for dosing these animals with arsenic in the drinking water? It's like, well, we don't need a justification. It's considered safe according to the EPA. Like, well, wait a second. You're saying that it's not safe. No, our hypothesis is that we're going to see a difference in wound closure. But according to the EPA, this is safe water. I'm not sure why we need a justification to deliver safe water to mice. You with me? It was kind of an interesting back and forth conversation. So what we saw, what you see over here on the left is that the female mice were, um, the wounds were more open um, after six days of, of, of healing time. Now mice heal really quickly. In a week, usually the wounds are totally healed. Okay? It's accelerated about six-fold compared to us. <clears throat> and on the right graph, erythema is a redness score, like um, the amount of inflammation. And you can see that the female mice that were on arsenic had significantly higher levels of inflammation um, after six days compared to controls or to the males. And where we're headed with this therapy or with this, with this finding is a therapy where we're building new scaffolds now. These are tissue engineered or regenerative medicine scaffolds where we e-spin them and we impregnate them not with a cell, but we impregnate them with a chelation agent. And the idea of a chelation agent, so this is uranium, now I'm switching to uranium, but it's a similar type of response. You can see control um, levels of closure. So this is back to the, the scratch assay on the bench top. After uh, 24 hours, nearly closed, the control scratches, the control wounds. If you have uranium contamination, you see a similar type of bar with arsenic. You actually see a drop off like we showed earlier with the arsenic. If you add a, a phytic acid or any other chelator, your elegant chelator of choice, and of course this is where companies would come in and say, hey, we want to test this chelator or this chelator, or can you, can you e-spin it, can you electrospin it, um, where this is just a technology where we create a slurry of a proteinaceous fluid. It's in a syringe, and it has an injection tube to a tip. That needle is charged with about 20 to 30,000 volts, and there's a gap, and it's positively charged. There's a, a, a negatively charged plate, and as you inject the fluid, it becomes electrified, and it moves from the positive charge to the negative charge, collects down here, and has, on a scanning electron microscopy view, has a look of like a bowl of spaghetti that's been dumped onto a plate. So the fibers are all kind of in a um, uh, random orientation. Now, you can actually rot you could do this uh, and, ro and rotate a mandrel and get aligned fibers. And then just, you know, you rotate the mandrel, and then you slice it this way, and now you have a skin graft that has aligned fibers, but our skin is actually um, randomly oriented, okay? Irregular in architecture. Okay, so next up, how are we doing on time? We go to nine or 9.15? Nine. Nine, okay, so we're, we're on phase two and then there'll be one more little segment 
and then we're done. So this is looking at building scaffolds with that electrospinner, but instead of using a chelator, we're looking at novel antimicrobials. So I showed some of those diabetic foot ulcers, and one of the big issues associated with them is contamination of the microbiome as it sort of outpaces that homeostatic balance of what's supposed to be normally on your skin, right? So if we culture swab your skin today, right, every one of us will have a different profile. Right? We could fingerprint ourselves based upon the bacterial colonies that are on our skin, right? And we could list them here on the board. It would be all unique. And then if we all came back in well, I won't say 40 years for me. Let's say 20 years for me and 40 years for you, and we did it again, that would actually change. That profile would change. And most of it would change because we'd have different disease states in place that we're wrestling with. Some of us might have in a room this size non-healing wounds. Okay? You've got to put you 40, 50 years down the road. Okay? And if you have a non-healing wound, that microbiome is going to fluctuate. So the idea here is looking at novel antimicrobials because this is the issue. This is the issue is we've got multi-drug resistance because we just love throwing antibiotics at everything. It's the American way, apparently. And just in 2013, we've had, you know, 2,000 million, uh, 2 million infections, excuse me, 2 million infections directly associated with multi-drug resistance about 10 billion in extra costs in medicine. Again, if the goal is to reduce the cost of healthcare, this is not the direction we want to be going. And over 10,000 deaths from just Staph aureus infections in the hospitals alone. And that's just one of an entire population. There's about five culprits in diabetic foot ulcers, and Staph aureus is one of the five. We've got a million additional hospital stays from infected surgical uh, sites. I mean, these are when cases are supposed to go correctly. They're having surgery done. And then you, you overlay this over something like we just experienced with the pandemic, where we have limited capacity in hospitals. This is really a problem. And this is the only one of many other issues. You know, this is the one that I hone in on, on grant applications because I want the reviewers to care about wound healing. <laughs> right? We all do it. So partnering with uh, Dr. Uh, Andy Kopish and Emily Cope here at NAU, we're building um, a platform of ionic liquids and deep eutectic solvents. So the chemistry is Dr. Kopish's. The microbiome is Dr. Cope's. And then the wound healing application and the translational biology is me. And so it's kind of a fun project where we're using these designer uh, molten salts, which essentially are um, like a cation and an anion that at room temperature are in liquid form. So if you take salt, you know, sodium chloride, at room temperature it's a it's a crystal form. Well these molten salts are room temperature liquids. And what happens is it's really easy to incorporate into our electrospinner because we can actually take our syringe, make a proteinaceous slurry, add in the ionic liquids, and because they're charged fluids, they actually make this spinning happen even better. And what was interesting, um, this is actually an NAU patent that we filed and had issued. Um, so Arizona Border Regions actually owns this one now, uh, where this polymer solution, the literature, everybody would teach, hey, um, you can add ionic liquids to the electrospinning process because You've got your high voltage power supply going to a positive charge. You have your negative plate down here. This is a air distance of a gap. And when you turn on the power supply, you create this voltage. And sometimes you get an arc, and it's kind of cool and exciting until a grad student gets electrocuted. But, um, but it's, it's uh, low current. So it's just kind of a zap, and they freak out and usually swear at me. But they're fine. They're not, nothing, nothing bad is going to happen to them. And um, the literature said, hey, when you add this charged solution, this electrospinning process is more efficient. But then the resulting scaffold you rinse to eliminate the ionic liquid. So we taught the other direction of, hey, let's keep the ionic liquid, and we want to guarantee that it's presence in this type of amount. And now we have a method of manufacture patent on how to make it. 
right? So there's two things in the patent world is one, it has to be novel. No one else ha has, has to have done it. The second one, it has to be non-obvious. The non-obvious is harder to get around. Non-obvious to someone normally skilled in the art. So think about your field. And if you could say like, oh yeah, I would have thought of that, then that's obvious. But if the literature is saying you add the ionic liquids in here to make the spinning process more efficient and then take them out, and we say, we don't put them in there to, to make it more efficient. We put them in there because we want them in the end. The literature is teaching left and we teach take a right. Does that make sense? So now it's in the area of non-obvious. So we now have these scaffolds. This is what the electron microscopy looks like without uh, ionic liquids. Here's a 5% um, uh, weight to weight. And this is cage farnesol. And I'll show you a little bit more of that here in a second. And then these are the fibroblasts that are grown on the scaffold where the arrows are. So the first one is kind of just show that it's biofriendly. And then we started doing microbial corruption assays where we're looking at different percentages and seeing, you know, at 10%, we see a reduction that's of interest. At 20%, it actually goes even further. At 20% of the cage farnesol, the cells don't love it as much as at 10%. So we kind of trying to dial in what kind of antimicrobial scaffold are we going to be able to make um, and, and then test it in an animal model. And that's what we're going to do. Um, down here is just trying to highlight um, if you vary the different formulas, you'll get different um, biofilm eradic eradication levels because some of the ionic liquids are better at targeting, say, for example, um, uh, Staph aureus versus C. albicans. Okay, so depending upon the patient, it may be end of use, it may be a swab on the patient to determine, okay, uh, C. albicans is in, in uh, higher, it's out of whack. We need a scaffold or a bandage for this patient to help close the wound that's going to help minimize C. albicans because it's out of whack. So it's not going to be a one silver bullet. Does that make sense? It's going to be, hey, we customize this based upon a swab that comes from the patient, and then we can actually deliver a customized scaffold that's going to help bring that bioflora right to the right level so that it's not... Um, out of control. Questions? Yeah, uh, just on that swabbing, are you swabbing the area around the, the injury, or are you swabbing the injury itself? You probably, would swab, you probably would swab both. Probably right into the wound bed, that'd be one test, and then you'd probably in the wound margin, the second test. And I would imagine you're going to get two different population profiles. It's mm -hmm. a great question. Yep. So, the area on the wound margin is probably more quote unquote normal. And the swab in the middle of the wound is going to be what's varied. And so if you can bring it more to the normal range, that wound is going to close better. And this is, this is like really new within the field of wound healing. Like we have never really thought through, you go to wound clinics and you start talking about swabbing, you know, behind the knee and behind the ear and in the wound. And they're like, what? <laughs> like, what are you doing? It's like, what? I, I can't even see anything. What, 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 are you, what are you talking about? Yeah, sure, there's bacteria there. No, there's probably like a dozen or two dozen different variants. Really? Yeah. And in the wound bed, there's five that are out of control. And in the literature, literature points to all this. Okay, so the last section is, is really more back to engineering. So years ago, a collaborator and I, Dr. Ensley, um, sequenced the gene for uh, tropolastin. So this came out of um, the Human Genome uh, Project in the 90s, where now we have access to a lot of um, uh, basically DNA coding. And we can actually make certain types of things and express them in different organisms. So we, we express this in bacteria. Um, this is tropoelastin. It's, it's the liquid precursor to the elastin molecule. And what we can do with it is we can electrospin scaffolds that have different components of extracellular matrix proteins that mimic what your tissue has. So, for example, in our skin, we actually have about 10% when we're young and healthy, 7 to 10% elastin. And then about 90% um, or 89% collagen, 
And then the remainder, 1% to 2%, is other extracellular matrix proteins. Collagen is a very stiff protein, okay, and gives tensile strength to skin. And elastin is actually like a rubber band, and it gives, it gives the recoil that we were talking about earlier. So early on, we just showed that you know, we can blend this and make a 100% collagen scaffold on the electrospinner. Uh, we can make 100% tropolastin, which is more compliant on a stress strain profile. And again, we go back to growing cells on it, dermal fibroblasts. I, I love dermal fibroblasts. We just have a giant liquid nitrogen tank full of dermal fibroblasts because that was the cell I learned on. And those are all the blue cells here. They love it. Um, this is an animal model. We're back to the full thickness wound model. So in, in our lab, we do a lot of bench top work, and then we try to translate it into a mouse wound model to make sure that it works, it, it, it moves. And then from there, we go into the human clinic. Um, this is our scaffold. This is acellular. This has no drugs in it. It has no antimicrobial. You could add all those things, but what we wanted to show in this um, experiment was that the architecture, or the, and, and Jeff will appreciate it, the structure of how it actually is fabricated will impact the way it performs. So the structure is going to lead to better functional performance. Like it's not by accident that there's a 90-10 blend in skin. And oh, by the way, if you go to the aorta, there's about 40% elastin in the aorta, right? Which is the major blood vessel off the heart, and it's under high pressure. So in, in the bladder, we have elastin. Blood vessels, we have elastin. In bones, we have single-digit percent elastin, but we have just enough that if you flex a bone, it, it's not brittle and snap unless you're 85 years old. But when you're young, you know, oh, their bones are rubber. Well, that's actually not true, that statement that parents would make. It'd be more accurate, so they still have a lasting component within their architecture of their bone. They're going to be fine. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, I was that dad. So Oasis is a commercial control in the dark circles. The wound healing device is in the um, pink boxes. And what we're looking at after 28 days of healing, and this is the mouse model. We didn't stop at day six because we wanted the remodeling that went out to a full four or five weeks to see how the mechanics are going to perform. Because what we're going to do, here's the wounds. We do these splint models. These are splints because the, the, the mouse has a subcutaneous muscle layer that actually helps it to contract and close faster than humans. So we try to keep it open. And um, this is just one of these scaffolds going in. This is a video, and then we just you know, kind of showed you. After it goes in, it sort of hydrates and disappears. But then after uh, wound healing device up top, Oasis is the commercial control. So this is standard of care in the clinic. And what you're looking at is a piece of skin, and this box in higher magnification is to the right, of our device after 28 days. The Oasis device, here's a piece of skin, higher magnification view here. You can appreciate, if you know any skin histology, you can appreciate stratum corneum up top, um, and then this is the dermal layer here. Same magnification, same scale bar, after four weeks, much thicker remodeled skin, and these are hair follicles. So we're actually regenerating hair. If you remember back to the dermograph chainsaw guy, he had a full mustache after a year, right? So we're, we're, it, it, but that had living fibroblasts that were neonatal. So here we're able to regenerate structural, functional units within skin without any cells, without any drugs, simply by playing around with the architectural arrangement and the composition of the material. So this is a video, this is a pull test. We cut out that piece of skin and we pull on it. Um, and what we're trying to do is actually look to see where it fails. That's what engineers love to do is, you know, let's blow up the bridge and see how many sticks of dynamite it takes to make it blow up. So here we're just going to pull until it snaps. And we can get stress strain to failure. And the uh, wound healing device, the wound healing device, which is shown here kind of in this pink profile, superimposes over control tissue. The oasis only goes here to blue. And the control is actually here. It fails really early if you do nothing. Well, it wasn't nothing. It was actually 
standard of care where we actually kept the wound clean, we bandaged it, etc. But the wound healing device, again, no cells, no elegant drugs, no biologics, uh, was able to close that wound and uh, faster with better performance mechanically, just to kind of answer Dr. Saul's original question. So that's all I have for you today. Um, it was a lot, but I wanted to give you a little bit of history. It was, a, it was probably a, you know, an easy read, but I was hoping this, for you to see kind of like, hey, in the 1980s and 90s, this is what it looked like. Then in the early 2000s, and then here's what we're doing with it today, and then trying to pepper in there like all professors. Hey, I want to talk about my research at the university. <laughs> so thanks for your attention today.